Hi there, I'm Taylor Abrahams and you're watching The Music Enthusiast. Hi guys, it's Gracie from The Music Enthusiast and today I'm here with Taylor Abrahams. How are you? I'm great, how about you? I'm great, thank you for doing this. Our blog loves your music. Oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> All right, right into the questions. What made you wanna get into music? Uh, I think just listening to music made me want to get into music. Uh, I actually pretty vividly remember the first times I ever heard music in my life. Uh, I mean, granted, memories are a little iffy early in our lives. You know, I like I remember in a past life being Amelia Earhart. Um, so, you know, sometimes our earliest memories might be a little off, but that might also be true. You know? never know. But anyway, you never know. Uh, there's also, uh, yeah, so basically I, I recall early in my life, uh, maybe even coming back from the hospital or something like that after I was born, just hearing uh, songs on the radio. And the first song I ever remember hearing was, oh, I've seen, oh, I've seen fire and I've seen rain, the, the, uh, the James Taylor song. Yeah. And so, and that stuck with me. And I, I, but when I started to take music really seriously, it was when I started to listen to music in the dark when I was 12 years old or so. And I would just listen to albums from start to finish and just let my imagination go wild. And I'd see these incredible stories play out in my brain. And it just seemed like there had been all this stuff just dormant in my soul that had been waiting to come out. And songwriting in particular was a way to express a lot of that. I, I'm not sure if music is my only outlet for my psyche, but it's a it's a vital one, mm -hmm. and one that I've that I can't stop thinking about. Yeah, I mean, obviously you've been doing music and loving music for a long time. Out of those years, do you have a favorite musical memory that you can think of? Oh, favorite musical memory, honestly something that felt like a really satisfying culmination of my musical life so far was when I was just bed tracking this album with Eddie Kramer. So he's this legendary producer who I got to work with on this project. He, you know, 50 years of history, he recorded Jimi Hendrix, everything he ever did and a couple of Beatles songs and, you know, everyone at some point or another. And just being in, uh, it was at Revolution where we did the bed tracking with the band and it was this culmination of just so much work and heart and care. And it just felt like I was really giving something of myself to all time and, and, and to the spirits. And so that was really satisfying. You know, it was like the modern equivalent of dancing around a fire, I guess. And uh, so it was really, that was really satisfying. Other memories that come to my mind that are musical are like <laughs> ridiculous county fairs as a kid. Um, uh, and just improvising. I, I love those special moments where I'm making up a, a goofy song with an audience and they're just laughing their asses off at it. And we're all just one. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, ultimately what I've realized is as much as my ego tries to get in the way and make it all about uh, clicks and views and this and that, it's really just about connection for me. And some, some kind of spiritual connection that I don't have words for. Yeah. I mean, obviously, as you were saying, you've worked with some pretty big names in music. How has that felt for you? Um, good I guess it's uh you know it's it's also trained me to take away a lot of the significance because you know especially as a voice actor and as an actor uh I've worked with lots of big name people or whatever but the thing is success is just enough people saying that something is good you know or that someone is a big deal it all it just exists in language if you take away all that all you've got is a person yeah. you know it's it's all in the mind this oh my god look at this person who's right in front of me and uh you know I, I had a professor in university who uh 
has this great story about just wanting to meet Bjork so badly and going to Iceland with on the sole purpose of this pilgrimage to meet her. And he kept running into Sigur Ross and he's like, oh man, Sigur Ross again. <laughs> like just everywhere he, he went. Uh, and then finally at the airport on his way back, he sees Bjork and he's like, ooh, ooh, and he can't, can't get a word out. And she's just like, creep, like something like that. And I don't know. Life's too precious to uh, get caught up in all this, all this drama, and all this other stuff. It's, I, I, what I try to do for myself and for others, I think, is just to free us up to be with the actual facts, which is we're all just people. Uh, Facebook and Spotify and and TikTok and all these things are just are just things, and you know, no, really, we're all just people trying to connect with one another, and having a lot of plays doesn't even necessarily mean that you're really connecting with people yeah. you know so I try and un until they figure out a way to measure like your actual uh impact in the world with what you do mm -hmm. that, and that might be uh, there's endless variables there so I don't know how you would even do that but it'd be really fun if you could see that beside like every artist's uh name like this n scale out of 10 for how successfully they impacted the world at large you know because there's so many people who, who have had a profound influence that you have no idea about yeah like uh, like my friend mary margaret o'hara who uh incredible singer songwriter you know definitely eccentric and uh you know very young at heart so she like doesn't really care about like trying to put out other albums and, and all this stuff but that one record she did led to this career where she was backing up Tom Waits and all these huge artists and also meant that that one record she did was a profound influence on a whole generation of female artists. You know, you can find Nora Jones covering her songs. Uh, I know that Florence and the Machine and artists like that really looked up to her, uh, even though just one album that's relatively obscure. So you really have no idea what your impact and your influence is just because the numbers say something. You know, and it's it's so tiring and so hard. Like you, you literally cannot be authentic if all you're trying to do is is play by these games that have been uh, given to us by the machine. You know, I feel like I'm living in Blade Runner a lot of the times, yeah. and I I I don't like that. I I'm trying to turn the world uh, more into Harold and Maud, maybe if you know that movie. Just just something happy. Come on. Yeah. Well, you kind of answered this in that last question, but what has it been like for you starting out in the music industry? Because I know for some artists, they see it as competitive. Well, yeah, I. it's always been uh, competitive. There's always been that implication throughout all of it. And mm -hmm. from an early age, I was entering all the talent shows and I'd enter Oshawa Idol and Peterborough Idol and all the idols and you know eventually Canadian Idol and it's all just it's it's competitive depending on what you're looking to get out of music mm -hmm. um but at the same time all the artists that I really look up to and all the people I really admire they they aren't they sincerely aren't concerned with that stuff um and the most uh, inspiring people, like someone like Eddie Kramer, working with him, he's definitely someone who, while he's, you know, trying to make a living still and all that stuff, he's ultimately concerned with the emotion of what he's doing and trying to make something that really impacts people mm -hmm. and finding artists who he finds genuinely interesting and exciting, you know? And so that's what, like the first thing when he met me is he said, you're the most interesting artist that I found at this whole music conference. He didn't, it's not like, oh, I can make so much money off of you. You know, that was never the intention. And, and he's 78 and he's jumping around like he's 24. And I think that it's precisely because of that attitude that he has of yeah. like, of truly do doing what you love and, and not making it about appearing a certain way or meeting some you know, idea of success. I think it's deconstructing all that uh, and really getting to ground zero, getting to nothing, and then building for yourself what your idea of success is. Yeah. You know, um, so, so 
you can have Canadian Idol and all that where it's like, oh, I'll get a record deal and I'll get this and I'll get that. But um, at the same time, I always felt like something was eating away at me at the same time when I did those. Sometimes they're short enough that they're just silly fun and you're a kid and it's exciting. It's nice to sing for anyone when you're a kid and you want to sing, you know, so that's the satisfaction of it. But uh, definitely Canadian Idol was when I was on that. Um, I left it feeling kind of used and you know there's a lot of weird stuff that they do behind the scenes like you know deliberately withhold the song um, from you for hours and hours and hours that you have to learn or practice so that they can create this sense of drama you know uh, so you're running on two hours sleep and then you're supposed to you know go on camera and potentially be seen by millions of people um, it, like there's the reality show politics there's you can tell the people that they've decided oh we want to focus on this person and you know twist them in this way and you know there's there's so much stuff I did there that they deliberately didn't show that would have painted me in a better light you know there's all that kind of politic and I you know when I left it I was just kind of relieved and like I was listening to like a weird as heck David Bowie album uh going back home and just feeling like yeah this feels right yeah well, talking more on your music, how do you tend to find inspiration for your songs? Um, it's all over the place. I, I, I like that Burt Bacharach idea of just writing every day, mm -hmm. no matter what, because you, you want to keep the pencil sharp. You want to you keep your mind sharp. You want to keep the channel open. Um, and then there's times where things really happen in your life that... Um, as long as you've been practicing the craft of that and building up your toolkit, you'll, when inspiration strikes, you'll have the tools to communicate that really effectively. You know, you don't want to just wait on inspiration and then just trust that you're going to write an incredible song because you feel it. You know, it's a uh, communication is an art form and that's what songwriting is, is an art form. And whatever you're trying to communicate, it's, it's, for me, I guess it, 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 it comes down to having an idea, whether it's an experience that I've just gone through. Um, like, you know, I don't care anymore is this song that I'm now starting to promote and I'm having a music video for it soon, but now it's kind of re out as a single now. Yeah. And that was a song that, you know, I was still writing every day, but that was a song that was a lot of concentrated uh, anxiety and shame around uh, a relationship ending, a long-term relationship, and stuff that I was kind of avoiding in my writing around that time, and I was just like, I can't avoid this anymore. I, I got to just put it into something. Yeah. Um, and I just got a notification on on my phone here. Um, so I I was mentioning James Taylor earlier and how he was like the first person I ever heard. So I think, um, I think I might be in his Instagram story right now somehow. For, really? anymore so that's really neat and full circle I know he doesn't run it it's like a social media person but still, maybe he sees it I don't know um but that's really cool and full circle uh Eddie actually uh produced uh Carly Simon's debut album and she was married to James Taylor for many years but and that it was a song that came out of uh you know avoiding dealing with those feelings and being like okay let's try and write something and just just see what comes. And I just, I've always liked birds. So it was me putting a bird metaphor into it. And, and it, you know, sometimes you don't really know where it comes from, but you know that you've, you've got some kind of germ that you're starting with and going out from there. And then I didn't, I was stuck when it came to the bridge. I knew logically, okay, I should go into like a different key. Um, start this on a chord that everything else hasn't started with you know there's you know the the mathematics of it too mm -hmm. and I figured that would make sense with this particular song and then uh so I was looking out the window and I saw this couple walking by who were just you know walking in the snow together and you know looked really happy and I was just like oh, damn and so I just made it I just want to walk through the snow with you and I, you know, I noticed I, I'd been listening to a lot of songs at the time that were more willing to repeat a lyric 
and more sparse about things. So I was experimenting with that. Mm -hmm. And so really, I think the intention was, let's write something really uh, simple and true and honest and just get down to the core of it. Like I've always loved Randy Newman or John Prine um, or artists like that for, for that reason, you know, that you can say a lot with a little and, or Tom Petty, you know, people who are very good at getting it down to just what it needs and nothing else. So I think that was just, you know, an attempt at that. And, um, but you just have to have some kind of germ, even if you can't put it into words, it's like, you know, I've got a concept here, even if it's um, like with heaven in your eyes, all I thought was, I want to write a song that's like me trying to write, wouldn't it be nice by the Beach Boys? What would that sound like? You know, and then I just, you know, figured that out. Um, the, the thing is, I have a trillion things that I start and very few that I finish. I've got thousands of dictations on my phone here. Um, and so, and then the challenge is going through all that and finding the stuff that's worth finishing at this time. And I, you know, I hope that maybe a few years from now I can, I don't know, outsource to India and get the rest of the songs written by someone else or something. And we split writer's share just so something happens with all these, I don't yeah. know, I'm, but you know, that's part of being a songwriter is you have so many ideas and what do you do with all of them? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you've had a very busy couple of years releasing your debut album and releasing a bunch of singles. How does releasing music feel for you? Is there any nerves around that? Um, I wouldn't say there's nerves. I've been on stage enough in situations where you have no idea what's going to happen and in a state of uncertainty that I'm pretty comfortable with that. Certainly I've had uh, nightmares where, for example, my brain is suddenly implanted into Brian May's brain and then I have to go on stage and play all those solos perfectly. <laughs> you know, that would terrify me. You know, I, I did a lot of like improvised music in university where we would do these these soirees where anyone would just get up and make something up and wing it and figure things out on the fly. And, and I realized how much people love that energy and, and, and love that, that experiment and that willingness to just go for it, which is kind of what TikTok encourages as well, which is cool. But um, yeah, ultimately, I guess I approach it the same way with the promo strategy. It's just well, here we go. We're flying by the seat of our pants. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can, improv comedy taught me, it's like you, you start with an idea and then you just yes and that, you know, and, and you build, right? So, all right, maybe uh, the thing that catches on is not the thing I expected to catch on uh, inside of promotion. And I was like, all right, well, let's just run with that and see what happens. Uh, but also, I know that my songs are um, good and interesting and uh, atypical. I thought I would be a lot more nervous than I am. Um, but that was because I had ridiculous expectations on myself as being way too hard on myself. Um, I hope that answers the question. I could, yeah. I could go more into it. I yeah. think that's the gym. No, it's a great answer. I totally understand what you were saying. Um, speaking more on your song, I don't care anymore. You obviously said that it was written a while ago and it's been in the works. Was there a process to how you decided it was your next single? Um, it was kind of just, I knew that I should release it as a single. You know, it's a it's a accessible enough song. It's, it's one that's a good representation of me as an artist. Um, you know, it's like, if you hear, I don't care anymore, you'll probably like a lot of the other things that I have, even though they could be widely different. It's like the S there's a lot of my essence in that because it comes from a very real place. So it just, it's a good introduction to everything that I'm doing. So that makes sense to put that out as a single. And yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I've been having you know, to be totally honest, it's been an absolute gamble this entire time uh, to trying to build an audience. And um, you never know, what's weird about today is you never know what the thing is that's going to explode. I had a TikTok video I posted in the summer 
that got like a million views and it's six seconds of me singing on a beach really? and I have no idea why it blew up no idea and because I have no idea I couldn't replicate it and I also like barely used the app so it was like five days later that I found out what why does this have like 70,000 likes now yeah. you know like we're in a weird age where you have no idea what is going to um be your overnight success story so um for me ultimately I'd like to find an audience on my own terms mm -hmm. and be a little bit more cautious about what I put out I don't think I'm answering your question anymore <laughs> but okay. I kind of, whatever you want but, um, um, yeah you've been making music and listening to music for a long time obviously have you mm -hmm. seen your music change from when you started to now releasing your single of 2021? Um, well, certainly in the background, I've been writing music pretty differently the last few years. Now, that stuff really hasn't come out yet. I My mission is to announce something by my birthday in May and be able to share something new then. But uh, I'd say that if you compare me when I first started songwriting to now, what's interesting is, yes, there's an improvement, uh, particularly uh, lyrically, mm -hmm. but uh, musically, uh, it's still similarly playful and, you know, trying to um, make something that's both accessible, but experimental at the same time, you know, like a song like I won't put up with it. I, that was me saying, I want to write a song that's like, tempted by squeeze if you know that song tempted by the fruit of another something that's very it's got this nice driving beat that keeps it uh consistent and keeps it accessible and keeps you listening but then it'll go into some weird places harmonically um mm -hmm. but you don't mind it because you've got such a sick groove going on so i wanted to make a song like that um and going back to when i first started i think that there's something similar going on where I like to find just a cool premise for a song and and run with it. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, like even when I was 15, I was making little rock operas for history class and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I I was always I always had a lot of big picture ideas and would, you know, within the first two, three years of playing guitar, because I made it so pleasurable for myself, I gained most of the skill that I have now. <laughs> and you know, I I I've probably learned like a handful of chords and inversions since I was 15. Like more, I've, I've been just trying to refine as a songwriter, but I had the same toolkit is what I should say. Yeah. This is more of a fun question for you, but if you could describe yourself and your music in three words, what do you think they would be? Mm. Health, healthy, healthy, light ooh. how about that healthy light ooh okay those are good yeah. answers <laughs> very original um good. do you have any dream collaborations for your future oh man uh let's let's just say the people that i grew up with because i at least want to meet them before they go you know and and thank them and have them just get the acknowledgement and you know as an artist it's sometimes very hard to know uh, the effect that you've had on people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been really surprised even the direct messages I get about some of my songs and how specifically touched people are by it, you know? Because, you know, if you look at my numbers, you'd think, yeah, okay, artist starting out. But the messages I get about like, oh my God, you really helped me get through that is amazing. And so I, I've, I've just had, uh, you know, artists like Elton John and Randy Newman and uh, James Taylor and Queen and people like that who have had that kind of effect on me. And I want to be able to thank them. In fact, what I'd love to do is interview them. And I actually, I did reach out to some of them. Uh, there's their managers just doing that with my album and like, hey, can I just interview you guys? Because I'll ask you really uh, nerdy questions that no one else ever asks you that you've probably been wanting to be asked your whole lives about like some deep cut. Um, maybe something will happen, I don't know. But yeah, I, 
I'd just love to interview these people. The idea of collaborating with them is uh, a little more intimidating. It almost seems like they never really collaborated with anyone else. So why would they collaborate with me? Mm -hmm. You know, like Paul McCartney after John Lennon, the only person he collaborated with briefly was Elvis Costello, you know? So I don't see why Randy Newman would be like, hey, let's write a song together. You, know? you never know. You never know though, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of songs, do you have a favorite song right now that you've been listening to? Oh, favorite song I've been listening to. Um, you know what's, okay, I'm just gonna say the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, there's the Kylie Minogue song, Come Into My World. Mm -hmm. You know that? Come into my world. I've just been appreciating how awesome the and dense the production is in that. You know, it's easy to, uh, you know, rag on pop music for being kind of banal and all this. But if you strip back the layers, it can be really impressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's an incredible example of just interlocking parts that just feel like, how does this work? It's like, it's working on so many levels. It's like a, it's like an artisanal sandwich made by a master chef where there's just little bits of all these things that shouldn't work together, but they do. And then it's just like a whole other level. So, so that's cool. Um, on an emotional level, um, I keep trying not to be an old prude, but I end up being a bit of a prude where, uh, I don't hear a lot of really resonant melodies lately. And I've tried, I've tried so hard to, to find newer artists that have those for me, but I keep going back to a lot of classic songwriters for those. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there's a lot of amazing production and musicianship still out there. Yeah. And uh, so I can appreciate a lot of modern music for that. But I, I guess I'm trying to bring back something that I feel is missing in songwriting itself. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's because a lot of songwriting does end up happening at a computer rather than trying to make it work with the bare elements first. If you can make a song really work well and be completely engaging just with a guitar and a voice and then add all the cool sounds to it, then you've got something that has a much better chance of truly working. Yeah. But when it requires all that stuff in order to work, it's kind of like, you know, icing on a mud pie, I guess. Yeah. Um, my last question for you, our website is all about up and coming artists. Do you have your eye on anybody or is there anyone you would recommend to others? Mm, yeah, well, I mean, there, there are some Canadian artists who I think are uh, doing something really impressive and, and finding themselves um, and, you know, have just uh, amazing souls that are coming out in, in their voices. Um, there's a female singer named uh, Laura Anglade, who is just a very charismatic uh, jazz singer. Um, there's uh, Nephi, who I've collaborated with a bit, and she's got a, an incredible voice. Um, those are two off the top of my head. Uh, there's definitely others. Uh, oh, man. But th those are just some, some Canadian examples that I, I, I wanted to encourage. Um, and then, yeah, frick. Because I feel like anyone else, people might already know about, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I could recommend some, some, uh, some older examples as well that are, are worth unearthing. Like I would say for people to listen to Mary Margaret O'Hara's album from the 80s, Miss America. Um, and I think that anyone who is a country snob you know, I'm like, oh, country music, bleh, uh, should at least do themselves the solid of listening to something, you know, like Casey Musgraves albums and, and Willie Nelson. Yeah. Uh, really digging into that stuff. There's just some excellent songwriting there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview. It was so great to meet you and talk to you. You're very welcome. <laughs>